The Gateway brings you the day's news from the St. Louis region and across Missouri. It also includes stories from the Illinois side of the river and our Metro East reporter, Will Bauer. In Alton, in Belleville, in East St. Louis, in Edwardsville, in Cahokia Heights, at Scott Air Force Base, I'm Will Bauer, St. Louis Public Radio. Listen to reports from Will and all of our journalists weekdays on The Gateway, on the STLPR app, and wherever you get podcasts. Hello and welcome to the Politically Speaking Podcast. I'm your temporary host for today, Jason Rosenbaum. Chris McDaniel is unfortunately out with the flu today. I hope you get well soon, Chris. Joining me in studio today is... Surprise! Joe Manis with the St. Louis Public Radio and The Beacon. So we're going to be doing something a little bit different on today's podcast. We're going to be talking about a couple of issues that have percolated throughout the Missouri political universe And then we're going to have a very, very good interview with Representative Jay Barnes, a Republican in Jefferson City. I always talk about us breaking new ground on the Politically Speaking podcast, (laughs) but this is actually a different direction where it's going to be partially us blabbering about stuff. And then the rest of the show is going to be an interview that was taped while we were in the studio here in St. Louis and while our guest was in Jefferson City. So yeah, was, so we had two studios. So it was very, very high tech. But before we get to the, the interesting stuff, Joe, there was, a, there was a hearing yesterday in Jefferson City. There's hearings most of the time when the session is in session, but this one got a lot of attention. It was, it was on so-called right to work, which as you always, you, you can always explain what right to work is better than, than me. Um, but what happened in that hearing? Okay, well, what happened in the hearing is what always happens when you have hearings about controversial issues. You've got people from both sides there, and it got pretty tense. Now, for our listeners, right to work is a technical term for a law that would bar unions and employers from operating closed union shops, which means that all the workers would have to join a union and pay union dues if a majority vote to join a union. Now, under the proposed change, uh, Speaker Jones, Tim Jones, would prefer uh, prefer to refer to this not as right to work, but as worker freedom. Or freedom to work or whatever. And detractors like to call it right to work for for less. Correct. I think the shorthands are used because, as you just noted, it's it's kind of a convoluted thing to explain. Correct. Correct. We'll just call it right to work for shorthand. Don't send us any hate mail. We're just trying to be succinct here. But continue. Basically, in this case, this is pitting um, conservatives and some business groups against labor and their allies. And, in fact, there are some businesses on the other side, I mean, who are aligned with labor on this. Uh, so at the hearing, as again, you heard from both sides, this is being brought up now at the beginning of the session because Speaker Tim Jones, a Republican from Eureka, uh, wants to get this before the floor and through the House fairly early in the session, if possible. I talked to him just a few hours ago just to get a, the latest update, and he contends that this is all about the fact that this is his last session in the House. This is his last session as Speaker because of term limits, and that he has this last shot to get right to work through, along with some other related issues uh, that, that he wants to get through, like tax cuts and some other stuff. But he's contending this is all about policy. Now, the other side is contending this is all about politics because Jones is widely expected to run for statewide office, perhaps attorney general uh, in 2016, and that he wants to establish his conservative credentials, especially with prospective donors, uh, which would be individuals and and major groups in, in Missouri and outside Missouri. Now, this is what the critics say. Now, Jones says that's not true. He's trying to make a better economic climate for Missouri. So we're setting the stage up. For this is what is going to be engulfing the House at least early on. Now, he says that he's got at least um, uh, 50 House members who already have aligned up with a subgroup that they've set up, sort of a caucus, an unofficial caucus. That is it is, called like Freedom to Work Caucus yes, or something yeah, like correct, that? Correct, correct. Hmm, continue. Okay, so that's the stage. And so this is what we're talking about now instead of some of the other issues. And... Again, this is early in the week, and later this week, a lot of campaign finance reports will be coming out, and people will be looking at 
trying to connect this issue and others with the money, which leads us to Jason's well, before, awesome uh, story. Before we get to that, I, I think anyone who's listened to this show or, or seen me elsewhere knows that I am a huge pessimist of any sort of right to work measure, be it a ballot or a statute of, of getting through the legislature. And the reason is, is more structural. This would something. This would be something that all nine Democrats would filibuster, and some Republicans would as well. In the Senate, you're talking about In the, the Senate. Senate. And I actually was thinking about this yesterday, of the possibility where, you know, maybe labor unions want this to be on the ballot so it would gin up support and money for the midterm elections. But the more I thought about it, the more unlikely that would be the case because, number one, there's a possibility that right to work could pass. Correct. Number two, I'm not really sure that national labor unions would want to spend millions and millions of dollars if an easier way to kill it would be through a filibuster. And also the other thing that I was thinking about is there are no competitive national elections next year in Missouri or very few. So I, I think that, you know, they may unions may want to have that fight in, you know, places where there are major national elections, like Ohio or Michigan or Pennsylvania or whatever. Because um, they're hoping to replace some, some governors in Michigan and but, Ohio But the, none of those at play. And I don't, know if, I don't know if national labor unions want to spend $30 million so the Democrats could get three more seats in the Missouri Senate or 15 more seats in That's the House. That's my point. They're going to be wanting to spend that money in other states, not in Missouri. So I, I just think that the more likely scenario is this will pass the House, It will be filibustered into oblivion in the Senate. The Republicans will not use the previous question motion, which they haven't used since 2007. And really all this hoopla and and talk of this will probably fade when it's realized it's not going to pass out. That's my prediction. I could be wrong and I could be, you know, completely misreading this situation. But if you looked at this issue from past years, that is always what happens. Well, and my point is that, frankly— it doesn't matter for somebody like uh, Speaker Jones. It doesn't matter if he can get it through the House, and he admits that he can't. He won't have any influence over what happens in the Senate. He, if he gets it through the House, as far as his supporters go, and as far as conservative groups like Americans for Prosperity is ginning up, and doing something uh, this week in Jefferson City, and there. Uh, a group, an outside group that has some local supporters and who are who's who are pushing this. This then achieves its goal as far as some conservatives go, just getting it through the House. And I think some people are missing that. Uh, They're looking at saying, well, it's not going to pass. The governor would veto it anyway, which is true. It probably wouldn't have enough votes in either chamber for an override, which is possibly true. My point is that's not the goal. I'm not even really sure. I'm not really even sure it's that politically advantageous if it makes the ballot because – there is a possibility it could pass if there's low turnout during the the midterms. But Correct. if it's in November, then I don't see any scenario where that's on the ballot and a Republican wins the Jeffco Senate seat or they win the Lamping seat. I think they could even be at risk of losing the, the Jolie Justice seat that's open in the Senate. And there could be other situations in that in the House where – Republicans are running in areas with a lot of labor union members where it could backfire. I think that probably happened in 1978. Somebody pointed that out on Twitter. Yes. Now, you know, I was around in 78, as you would say. So <laughs> we'll see. But as I, I'm not trying when, when I'm when I'm expressing this pessimism, it's not really me saying the policy is good or bad. That's Correct. not for me to decide. But I think it's really important to put a realistic path forward for this and, and explain like, you know, People might be talking about it, but it has some major obstacles to overcome for it to even get to the ballot. So. Well, and this also is somewhat linked to a story they have in the site now about initiative petitions because there's a number of issues, uh, not just right to work, that c- could be on the ballot. And that would include the minimum wage and some other proposals that could be affected by this, even teacher tenure, because uh, teachers – while technically they might not say they were in a union, in effect, many of the teacher groups are powerful political players in the state. And so there are some who believe that this debate will affect some of the other issues that could be on the ballot. Now, going back to the topic that you were going to talk about before I started <laughs> blabbering, I guess this week is when campaign finance reports Correct. come out. You know, it's 2013. 
or 2014. I I got the year screwed up right there. So I guess people will be looking, for example, what the two auditor candidates are doing and what some of the 2016 hopefuls are doing. But and it's, county it's, executive and county executive. Those are the things that are 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 going to be percolating now that will actually matter in a few months. But it's still pretty early when it comes to the 2016 cycle. If we're looking at you know what the possible people for governor or attorney general are doing, because we don't even know if they're going to be candidates in 2016. But it creates momentum. So yeah. many people will be looking at Speaker Jones's campaign reports, for example, to see what sort of groups or individuals have given to him. It's not just about big money, which you have a terrific story on our site right now talking about the big money. I'll let you talk about it. But in the campaign reports, you also see how many smaller donations they got, how many donations under 5000 they got, uh, which sometimes goes beyond the below the radar because people are only looking at those when the reports come out four times yeah. a year. As, as, as far as the report you, you kindly alluded to, uh, you should check it out at stlpublicradio.org because it'll make me feel better for you to read my <laughs> stories. I took a look at the roughly 800 big donations that were given in 2013 to Missouri-based candidates and committees. And by big donations, I mean over $5,000. And There were some surprising things that I I found. I think the Democrats actually got more, in money terms, big donations. It was mainly fueled by people like Attorney General Chris Coster and Governor Jay Nixon taking a lot of big donations. Um, The Democrats also had a more diverse fundraising base. They got more money from attorneys, labor unions, corporations, healthcare firms, while Republicans were generally more reliant on big individual donors and You know, committee to committee transfers, either PACs giving to Republicans or other candidates giving to Republicans. So uh, the couple of political science professors I talked to said it's not necessarily a cause for concern for Republicans because 2013 is kind of an intermediate year before 2014. But we'll see what happens this year with both the big donations and the the, the under 5000 as you mentioned. Well, and this does, and your story does, though, offer a backdrop to this right-to-work debate and some other things because it does show you who's giving to who and where, who's giving the big money. Absolutely. So um, we're going to transition into our guest. Uh, as we're talking about right-to-work and campaign finance, another thing that's just been looming over the session is Medicaid and whether the Missouri legislature is going to expand Medicaid to 138 percent of the federal poverty level or go with an alternative proposal, which has been proposed by our next guest, Representative Jay Barnes. Now, for people who in St. Louis who don't know a lot about Representative Barnes, and he'll explain a little bit about himself, he was actually a, a former staffer for a number of people, including former Governor Matt Blunt, as well as a campaign staffer for former U.S. Representative Kenny Holsoff and former State Representative Bob Onder when he ran for Congress in 2008. He won election to the legislature in 2010, and he has emerged since then not only as the the chairman of a committee that investigates government, but also proposing some things that may go against the conventional wisdom of Republicans, like this Medicaid proposal and and like a lot of other things. He, he you, As you'll hear in this, I think he goes into great detail not only of his own proposal— but how he thinks that the posture that Republicans are putting forward now may not be as right-headed as some people think. Yeah, it, Representative Barnes is one of the key thinkers in the House. I would think that would be something he'd be glad to attach himself with. So Chris McDaniel is 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 part of this aspect of the podcast. This is before he got sick. This is before <laughs> he got sick. Um, hopefully this isn't too uh, convoluted for our listeners of doing this split format, but if our listeners like it, we're going to con- try to continue to do it into the future. But um, f- without further ado, after this break, we'll hear from Representative Barnes. And we're back. Joining us now from Jefferson City is Representative Jay Barnes. Good morning. I, I understand that it wasn't a very long trek for you to join us today. No, uh you know, being located right here in Jefferson City. It's down the street. It's about a mile and a half from where I live and less than a mile from my office. So how long have you been representing Jefferson City? I've been a state representative for a little over three years now. And how did that come to be? Uh, That's an interesting question. You know, I worked for, prior to being a state representative, I, I worked for Mike Gibbons when he was the president pro tem of the Missouri Senate. I worked for 
Governor Blunt. Uh, I was a speechwriter for Governor Blunt. I worked on Kenny Holshoff's campaign for governor uh, on policy areas there. And when uh, Kenny lost, I told my wife I was finished dealing with politics. And um, somehow, <laughs> a couple years later, we thought it would be a good idea to run again to try to make things better in our state and community. And now I'm here in the state capitol. Yeah, I just wanted to mention for our listeners that Mike Gibbons is the former head of the Senate, is from Kirkwood, and and is now a prominent lobbyist. My, and Mike Gibbons is a is a phenomenal guy, a great guy to ask about process, and really kind of a, a guy I look to as a role model for how to be a responsible legislator. Um, he did some things uh, when I worked for him. He he would not always take my advice, and sometimes I wondered why. And now that I'm on the other side of the desk, I completely understand why. It's a different perspective when you're on the, the side of the desk of actually making uh, the decisions, uh, being responsible for public policy. Well, your um, committee on Medicaid has been was very in the news a lot this summer. Uh, with the different hearings. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. I, we had two, actually two separate Medicaid committees that uh, one traveled all around the state and one took more technical testimony here in Jefferson City. And uh, we learned a lot. I spent a lot of time going around the state, some places I'd never been before, uh, and you know, trying to figure out a way forward for the state of Missouri. You put forth uh, a, a decidedly different plan on Medicaid than what the governor has been proposing, which is essentially a straight Medicaid expansion for adults up to 138 percent of the federal poverty level. I wanted you to take the opportunity to kind of explain what this proposal is and kind of why you see it as a better way forward than just what the governor is proposing or what many Democrats are proposing. Well, first, I, I would say that the the Democrats' proposal is sort of the Brinks truck theory of economics, the belief that all we have to do is bring the Brinks truck from Washington here, let it unload the money, and everything will be great. Um, I, I, I think there are some major improvements that need to be made to Medicaid. Um, it gets poor results for recipients, and it is on a path fiscally that is unsustainable for our state and country. And so what I've proposed to do is to give Missouri the most market-based Medicaid system in the entire country. And we do that by using legislation to transform recipients into participants who actually make some of their own health care decisions based on cost. So one thing we know is uh, under the existing Medicaid system, there's only managed care in a small portion of the state along the I-70 corridor. We would take that statewide, and for the first time in the history of our state, we would require the managed care companies that bid to serve the Medicaid population to actually compete on price. Then what we'd do is we'd turn the recipients into consumers and tell them, just like every other Missourian who has private health care, that price matters. The Medicaid participant will be given a menu with prices attached, and we'll tell them, look, if you pick the one that saves taxpayers money, you're going to get to share in some of the savings you bring to taxpayers. On the back end, we'd structure it a little bit like um, a high-deductible health plan where they would have higher co-pays and uh, responsibility for paying for their own health care. The problem, of course, with group of Medicaid recipients is they don't have a lot of income to do this. I think one way around that is the state could provide uh, some of the money to pay for that with the idea being that if they end up saving taxpayers money at the end of the year, they get to keep a portion of the savings that they generate. And this part of the plan is really modeled on something that Mitch Daniels did in Indiana when they expanded Medicaid uh, to 200 percent of the federal poverty level in Indiana, and I believe the year was 2007. And so what you get is you get real price competition, and you get a system where Medicaid recipients are actually thinking about the cost of their health care, and they have actual incentives 
to get health care at appropriate places and not, for example, in the emergency room. Now, um, as you know, um, you know, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, is the one that recommends going up to 138 percent, and there has been the issue of whether or not any of the federal money would actually go to states that don't comply with the 138 percent. So from your standpoint, do you think that your proposal would qualify enough so that the federal dollars would come? I, I think anything that gets across the finish line uh, would qualify. There are other states that are models now. Arkansas, obviously, is a model. Iowa is a model. Iowa has done some unique things to discourage emergency room uh, misuse that we might follow. Um, and so there's there's a way to get there from here. Now, what have you heard from um, the Missouri Chamber and some of the business groups that have been um, increasingly saying that they do support some sort of Medicaid expansion because they want to get those federal dollars? Well, I, not ju- I think their support is not just uh, on the side of getting the federal dollars, but also on the side of bringing Medicaid more in line with the market-based principles which their members uh, operate in in the real world rather than, you know, government programs. And I think the Chamber's support is on both sides of this issue, both uh, in the, the total package which involves eligibility changes and in the market-based reforms. What's your timeline? What's the timeline? As, well, as far as the, this session... Are you session be proposing in, this during the budget, or what's your timeline on this? Session ends in May, so my timeline to get a bill passed is sometime before uh, session ends in May. What do you see as the repercussions of not getting to 138 percent of the federal poverty line? And somewhat conversely, what do you see as the repercussions of just expanding to 138 and not really reforming Medicaid, just expanding it? Well, I, I would say there is absolutely zero chance that the Brinks truck theory, let's just expand this program, uh, is going to happen. That is not going to happen. Uh, I think the there is a great opportunity lost if we fail to do reforms with eligibility changes. And the opportunity is, for the first time in a really long time, maybe ever, states have an incredible amount of flexibility to remake Medicaid in a conservative mold. When I was coming up with this proposal, I went and looked at things that had been proposed by guys like Mitch Daniels, Paul Ryan, Matt Blunt, Rick Perry, and how to restructure Medicaid and said if we could start from scratch, if conservatives from, could start from scratch with Medicaid, how would they structure the program? And then the idea is, well, look, if we're going to go down this path and have some increases in eligibility, and I've proposed decreases as well, Uh, for some groups. We need to make clear to the federal government that we're not going to do this unless you allow the state of Missouri to operate Medicaid in the most market-based way any state has done so in the history of the Medicaid program. Now, what has kind of been the reception from from people? I mean, I've gotten the sense that this is seen as a template to kind of move this issue forward, but, you know, some Democrats have criticized the fact, as you kind of alluded to, that children's coverage goes down There are some other conservative Republicans that want to attach issue, namely uh, Senator Rob Schaaf of St. Joseph, like certificate of need and price transparency to this issue. Uh, What's kind of been the reaction to this plan and what do you kind of see as the challenges of getting it passed? Well, I think with with any complex piece of legislation, there are uh, people who have serious concerns from a, a number of different angles. I mean, it's hard. There are a lot of people that like the legislation. There are others who hate the legislation, and there are some who are in the middle and, and keeping an, an open mind. What reaction have you gotten from the governor's office and the administration? Um, the governor's office has been helpful with answering questions that I have about how Medicaid works, what they think might be possible. Um, so, yeah, they've been cooperative through throughout the process, both last session and. Uh, when we had the interim committees. Now, I I think more philosophically, it seems like there's a lot of Republicans who are hesitant or just outright opposed to the even 
prospect of expanding Medicaid or changing Medicaid because they feel it would be acquiescing to the Affordable Care Act and, you know, kind of giving President Obama a win here in Missouri. How, how kind of do you react to that line of argumentation? And do you just feel that there are pragmatic and practical reasons to kind of go on a route that you're proposing in this bill? Well, I disagree with that assessment. And, and I, let me give you some examples. I mean, Medicaid existed long before Obamacare. And before President Obama became president, there were conservatives around the country proposing to increase eligibility for Medicaid, but in exchange for the increases in eligibility to restructure the program in a market-based way. And so Mitch Daniels increased eligibility in Indiana to 200% of the federal poverty level and made reforms. Paul Ryan in what was the conservative alternative to the ACA in 2009 proposed essentially increasing Medicaid eligibility nationwide to 200 percent of the federal poverty level and actually have a benefit package that was comparable, if not uh, more generous, than what we'd offer here in my package. Governor Blunt with Insure Missouri contemplated increasing eligibility to 185 percent of the federal poverty level. Even Rick Perry in Texas proposed increasing eligibility in Texas under President George Bush to, I believe, about 250 percent of the federal poverty level. There was a time and place when it was not just okay, it was the thing to do for conservatives to figure out ways to make Medicaid more affordable for the nation's taxpayers over the long term. And none of these four guys I mentioned are, uh, they're all rock-ribbed conservatives. I'd like to think that ideas matter, and those ideas were good when they were proposed. And the bill I've proposed is completely in line with what's been proposed, what had been proposed in the past, and at least implemented in Indiana by Mitch Daniels, Paul Ryan, Matt Blunt, and Rick Perry. Are you going to put your proposal in a budget in the budget, or are you going to try to do your bill separately outside of the budget debate? Well, my bill is not, I'm not on the budget committee. Uh, The budget will be, the budget committee is chaired by Representative Rick Stream from the St. Louis area, and he's a great budget chairman. So the answer to that question is no. But I wanted to kind of switch gears to a a topic that dominated the last few weeks and months of of 2013, and that was the chase for Boeing's 777X, which is I guess for now, all all intents and purposes over after the Washington state machinists agreed narrowly to a contract. I read recently, though, that you are seeking kind of more insight into what went into Missouri's economic development proposal that got debated through the special session. Now, just for our listeners, I I believe you were one of the people that voted against the incentive package. Um, Kind of a two-tiered question. What are you kind of looking for within the guise of the committee that you chair? And what was kind of your overall view of the special session and kind of the uh, economic incentives that were put forward? Well, what I'm looking for in making the document request for the governor's specific proposal to Boeing is really nothing more than open government. The legislature authorized Governor Nixon to offer Boeing billions of dollars in taxpayer subsidies. And anytime you're talking about, forget billions, forget millions, anytime you're talking about any spending of public monies, taxpayers deserve to know the details of those kinds of offers. And so the request is motivated by a desire for nothing more uh, than open government so that taxpayers can see how these uh, how these spending uh, proposals are moving forward. As far as uh, why I voted no, I mean, there's a point at which uh, tax credit gives away too much money to make a return on investment for taxpayers. And I thought that this proposal went too far in how much it would have provided to Boeing to come here. So, for example, this proposal would have allowed Boeing to get refundable tax credits of up to 22.5% of new payroll. Well, if you consider they're going to pay, the state would get about uh, 5 to 6% of new payroll returned to it. The number of jobs Boeing would have had to create to break even 
would have been at least three times, uh, I should say, non-Boeing jobs created, would have had to be three times the number of Boeing jobs created. And that's assuming the non-Boeing jobs are at the same salary level as the Boeing jobs, which I don't think is a, a fair assumption. If, uh, so I calculated to break even, the Boeing proposal would have to uh, create thirty to 40,000 non-Boeing jobs. I didn't think that was realistic, and that's why I voted no. Now, some obviously Missouri did not get all of these Boeing jobs. Some people now have alleged that Missouri and other states were used as leverage for the machinists' union. Is that your take on it? I, you know, that that goes into Boeing mind, Boeing's mindset. Um, I I think the company was probably pretty serious about uh, moving, and uh, they wouldn't have gone through all of these steps. Uh, otherwise, and it, that if the machinists would have said no, I think they probably would have moved operations somewhere else. You were around in 2008, maybe on the peripheral. Did this entire situation give eerie parallels to you to the Bombardier episode that, that occurred when, you know, Missouri tried to get, you know, Kansas City Bombardier production? And, you know, that was put forth by a Republican governor and a lot of tax credit hawks like Senator Lager then Representative Lemke voted for that, and they voted against this, even though I think philosophically it's pretty similar. Like, did you get deja vu? And what do you think changed the mindset of people that voted for that but voted against this? Well, I think while there might have been some similarities, the scale of Bombardier versus this Boeing package wasn't Bombardier about two hundred and fifty million dollars? Yes, two hundred and forty over I think eight years. So we're talking about at least something that's at least seven times as big. And I think if you actually took an honest accounting of the governor's proposal, it would have been uh, ten times as large. Because even though the the number that's constantly been reported about this package is a maximum of one point seven billion in benefits to Boeing from the state, if you look at the actual legislation and do some simple math, the number was really two point four billion. So kind of switching gears more generally, you know, the, the, the General Assembly convened, I guess it was two or three days ago. It's, you know, there's a lot on the agenda as far as education, taxes, tax credits. What are kind of the things that you're going to be looking for as major priorities? And how do you think House Republicans are going to kind of uh, act and react to this session? Um, well, I, you know, I think the big topics, um, Medicaid, um, education, uh, executive overreach, I think we're going to have, we're going to have a lot of talk about uh, constitutional, a proposed constitutional amendment on the budget process. The, the governor has really abused the power to control the rate of spending. And so we're going to try to bring the Constitution back in line with the original intent of the language giving the governor the power to do that. Um, I think those are the big issues. But as and obviously, I, I forgot two big ones, which is tax cuts and its um, its twin uh, tax credit reform. So what what do you see, especially on those two issues? Uh, tax cre- tax credits has been kind of an issue where the House and Senate have been at loggerheads for a while. I read today, I guess, your your newsletter that you're taking a different approach and not necessarily focusing on low-income tax credits and historics, but some of the, quote, job tax credits. How do you see yourself on that issue, and how do you think the Senate and the House will will deal with it? Well, I think if the legislature is going to get serious about tax credit reform, it needs to look at these so-called jobs tax credits as well. As the chairman of the House Committee on Govern- Government Oversight and Accountability, we've held a number of hearings into what was then the Quality Jobs Act and is now Missouri Works and discovered that it does not work nearly as well as advertised. In fact, in the vast majority of cases, uh, the state takes a big swing and whiffs. And in many cases, uh, it's hard to know when the state authorizes these tax credits that the credits are actually a but-for cause of the job creation and instead that the state isn't being played by companies that are savvy enough to hire people to work the process at the Department of Economic Development and get these tax credits for jobs that they would have created in the state of Missouri anyway. 
Well, Representative, thank you very much for joining us from Jefferson City. To close us out here, you can read all of our stories at stlpublicradio.org. You can follow me on Twitter at at CSMcDaniel. You can follow Jason on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. You can follow Joe on Twitter at, at J Manis. That's J M A N N I E S. And you can follow Representative Barnes on Twitter at J Barnes Five. And to remind everyone again, we are on iTunes now, so you can go and subscribe to us so that you don't have to keep going to our page to look and see if there's a new one. Um, Though you should. Though you should, (laughs) because I'm sure everyone is constantly hitting refresh on the St. Louis Public Radio site. Um, Yeah, also leave us a review. It makes it easier for people to find us on, on iTunes. We'll be back next week. Until then, so long. So long. So long. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio.